Hey, SAF family, welcome to Church at Home. Uh, we are so glad that you're joining us today from wherever you're joining from, wherever you're streaming from, whether that's uh, locally here in San Angelo or anywhere around the world. Uh, we're so glad that you've taken time uh, to do church with us today. It's gonna be a great day. And we're just praying that uh, the message that you hear will be a blessing to you, uh, will encourage your spirit. And we want you to know that this week, as a church, we're praying for you and your family, and we love you. God bless you.
built on your faithfulness and my hope is held in your promises and I take each step with your confidence cause I am yours I am yours you Good morning, guys. Welcome to Church at Home. Thank you for worshiping with us uh, today. Uh, our SAF team does an incredible job leading us. And man, it's just good to be with you today, right there in your house for Church at Home. And, and today, um, fittingly, I want to title the message, Stay Home. I know that's what you want to hear. Stay home, right? There's no place like home. Home sweet home. Home's where the heart is, right? I mean, you're feeling that, aren't you? Uh, just to kind of kick us off the right way, uh, I found a couple memes that I enjoyed this week, and I wanted to share them with you because you need a little joy in your life, all right? Is anyone working from home right now that might identify with this picture, right? Uh, that's getting nothing done, right? How about this one? I love this dad's face. He's just like defeated. I don't know if they're praying or they're just like, we're just going to, this is life. This is the way we're doing life. 
uh, and I love this one. This is a, a letter from Ben uh, about homeschool. He said, it is not going good. My mom's getting stressed out. My mom's really getting confused. We took a break so my mom could figure this stuff out, and I'm telling you, it is not going good. <laughs> Do we have any people trying to homeschool that say amen to that, right? And then check this out. You said you love spending time with your kids. The COVID-19 quarantine determined that was a lie, right? I know there's not anyone that's watching this because you all, you know, you love your time with your kids, right? And this is the, this last one. Uh, me, this quarantine will give us time to bond and connect as a family. Me two days later. Do you people need to breathe like that the whole time? <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I love that. Um, I, I saw someone post on social media uh, this week, and I thought this was so true. Uh, they said these words. They said, you aren't stuck at home. You're safe at home. You aren't stuck at home. You're safe at home. And I would like to just take a moment today to propose to you that there is no more safe place in the entire world, in the entire universe, uh, in everything in creation. There's no more safe place for you than in the love of God for you. It is the most secure place that you will ever find yourself. Can I just say this? God's love is home. God's love is our foundation. God's grace is what we, what we, where we rest. So stay home. We're going to look at Luke chapter 15 today where Jesus tells a story about a young man who left home, and an older brother in this story who didn't really care at all, and a father who waited and waited and waited for his son to come home. The father is actually, what you're going to find out, is actually the main character of this story in Luke chapter 15. A lot of people think it's maybe the younger brother who runs away from home, but it's actually all about the love of a father. And before we jump to Luke 15, I want to show you just a few quick scriptures to sort of set up where we're going today. The first one is Isaiah uh, chapter 64, verse 8. Isaiah says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter, we are all the work of your hand. And then Jesus uh, says this in, in the next verse, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, when he's teaching his disciples how to pray, he says, This then is how you should pray, our Say it with me, our Father in heaven, hallowed be. In fact, that's what Jesus almost always, with the exception of one time, uh, always referred to God as Father. That's, that's what he said. Uh, and in fact, Jesus used one of the most intimate phrases in the Aramaic language. He, he used the word Abba, which means uh, Father uh, or Daddy or Papa. And studies have actually shown that all across the world, throughout different countries and cultures and languages, the first word that's actually most common among uh, babies is, is the word dada or papa or, or abba, almost as if they're showing their innate need for a father. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, Paul says this, Those who were led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For we did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, right? But we received a spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, this comes out of our hearts, right? Abba, Father. Now, I know, I just, I want to take a second because I know this message can potentially be difficult for some of us to hear this, that, that God is a Father. Uh, for me, it's easy. For some, it's much harder. And, and here's why. Some of us, we've had a great dad. I'm one of those. I have an amazing father. I can say wonderful, complimentary things about my dad and, and mean it. Some of you, uh, your dad was there, he was involved, he taught you how to love, he taught you respect, taught you how to live life, and he held you in his arms, he went to your games and, and your recitals. Others, others of us, we can't really relate to that. It's, it's more difficult for us to think of God this way because we never really had a dad, or, or the dad or dads that we had uh, were just plain bad. Some of you never met your father, uh, so it's hard to connect with this. In fact, when you think of fathers, maybe you think of broken promises. You think of affairs or alcoholism or abuse, or, or maybe you think of a, a, a workaholic dad who spent all of his time trying to make money and, and no time with you. And I feel like I have to say that because before we tackle this, these next few moments, because I believe the enemy would try to mess you up and really take, you know, you know, help sort of take over your mind in the next few moments to get in your heart emotionally so that really while I'm preaching to you, you're going to be so overwhelmed with with negative feelings and emotions that, that you might 
possibly miss the truth. Folks, the truth is really there whether our experiences bear witness to it or not. And this is the truth in Scripture, that God has decided to reveal himself to the human race as a loving father who cares for his kid. Regardless of your reality or your experience or how you've related to your own earthly dad, the truth today is this. The scriptures show us who God is. And, and, they, they, and so they allow us to, to take truth and replace the lie or the bad example or the bad experience. And so I just want to ask you, can we do that for a moment? Can we at least try? Let's listen to the Holy Spirit as he, as he magnifies God in this text. In Luke chapter 15, we're going to start in verse 11. Again, this is commonly known as the story of the prodigal son. should be the prodigal sons or really the merciful father. Because it's not the younger or the older son who steal the show. The father is the real hero in this story. His, his, this compassionate father who freely gives grace and mercy. In this, fair, in this parable, the father represents God. And there is no passage of Scripture in the Old Testament and New Testament that gives a more true and authentic glimpse of the character of God than this one right here. We're going to start in verse 11. And we're going to read through verse 32, so I hope you're ready to read a little bit of the Bible, because this is a great story. It says, Jesus continued. He's telling this story. It says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country, and, they, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything... There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine, I love this, was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. And the servant said, your brother's calm, he replied. And, and your father has killed a fattened calf because he's, he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. And so he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders Yet you never gave me even a young goat so, so I could celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Lost and is found. According to Billy Graham, this is the greatest parable ever told. And for many literary experts, the greatest short story ever told. Charles Dickens said it's the finest story ever written. It's absolutely astonishing in my opinion. And I want to show you five things today that we see in this story that really show us who God is, that tell us about his character. And I can show you multiple things about the younger or the older brother, but I want to focus on the father because... He's the hero. In fact, this story shows us the first thing, if you're taking notes, uh, God is wise. God is wise. And, and here's what we see in the story. We see that the Father loves you enough to let you leave. He loves you enough to let you to leave, to let you walk. 
Now that sounds counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't really fit our sensibilities of what uh, we think a dad should be. But let me just sort of set the stage for this parable. In a day, you know, in our day, when a, when a dad passes away and there are two sons, they don't really have to fight much over the estate if the father has left a will. But and in fact, I'm the oldest of two sons, and we have one sister. Um, and my dad will split stuff up between us and the way he sees fit, which means my sister will get most of it. That's, that's what that means. Uh, but 2,000 years ago, in Jewish culture, uh, there were expectations. The older son got the preponderance of, of the inheritance, the majority of the land and the livestock and the, what money had been saved, the estate. And you can actually see this all the way back in the, in the Old Testament. The older son got the, really the greater share of the inheritance, and the older son was, was considered the, the carrier of the family name and the legacy. And, and now the younger son did get a share, but really, it was once the father died, it was, it was actually significantly less than the older son, probably 50% less. So in this story, we have a younger son who comes to the father and says, you know, I'm sick of this. I don't want to live under dad's roof anymore. I don't want to abide by the father's rules and regulations anymore. I don't want to live under these expectations anymore. I'm sick of this one horse town where everyone knows everyone's business, keeping tabs on everyone's life and and, you know, talking to my dad about my every move. And the younger man actually says to himself, this younger son says, I'm leaving. I, I can do better without him. So he goes to the father, really in utter foolishness, and says, I want my share of the inheritance right now. Pony up with the cash. And sometimes the English language, we miss some of the, the nuances of the Jewish culture. Here's what he was really saying. He was really saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I wish that you weren't even alive. Let me go. Give me what's mine. The son is essentially saying, I want your stuff, Dad. I just don't want you. See, he wanted the father's things. He just didn't want the father. In other words, my relationship with you has been a means to an end, and I'm tired of it. I want my stuff now. Really, this was unheard of. As Jesus is telling this story, I guarantee every listener is going, are you kidding? What? This was, this was astounding what the father did. Because I read this, that commentators will say this, that the traditional Middle Eastern father could have really only been expected to respond in one way. And that is to drive that boy out of his house with, with uh, not just verbal, but potentially physical and violent blows. In the Levitical law, it, it essentially said, you can have a, a rebellious son executed. right? So for everyone to hear what this father goes on to do would have blown their mind. In Luke chapter 15, verse 12, remember what he did? He did. It said, the younger son said to his father, give me my share. And the father, what did he do? He went ahead and divided his property between them. Wow. Now, the word translated there for, for property is actually the Greek word bios. It's where we get the word biology. It literally means the father divided his very life apart between them. The son was actually asking the father to tear his life apart, to rip apart his standing in the community, to, to tear himself apart. And here's the crazy thing. He does. It was unheard of for a Middle Eastern patriarch to respond this way. This father is actually enduring the worst thing a human being can endure. Rejected love. See, when someone treats us this way, we get mad and reject, retaliate. We do everything we could possibly do to diminish our affection for the person so that we don't hurt as much. But this father maintains his love through it all. And he endures the agony of rejected love. And this father doesn't beg him to reconsider. He doesn't chase him down the road. He doesn't lock him in a closet. See, this father knew something. He knew there comes a time in your child's life where you really have to let them be their own person. And it's hard to do, it hurts. But what we see in the story is that God loves you enough to let you leave. And he knows you should stay home. But in his mercy, he will let you leave. I'll even say it this way. God loves you enough to let you hurt yourself. Now, wait, what? That doesn't sound like a loving God. A loving God is willing to allow his children to make mistakes to, to actually turn their hearts back to him. 
C.S. Lewis talks about this. He says, you know, we have a hard time with a loving God allowing hurt and pain in our lives. That we, we have a hard time with, uh, with that, but we don't really have a hard time believing that a surgeon would actually have to hurt us uh, to cut our skin to remove a tumor. That left alone would surely lead to our demise. And as a matter of fact, he says, a good doctor will actually continue to carve at your flesh and ignore all begging and pleading for him to stop so he can get the cancer out. So listen, God loves you enough to let you leave. And if you insist on having it your way and being this type of son or daughter, a loving father, a good God will actually say, I love you. I don't want you to walk away. But if you must, let's see how far you exercising your own will will take you. Eventually, the road's going to run out. The cash is going to dry up. And, and here's what God is saying. And I will be here waiting for you to come home. God's wiser than you. He loves you enough to let you leave. And here's the second thing I want you to write down. God is actually, he's understanding. He waits and he watches. Now, before we go too far, the Bible says something uh, in a verse that blows my mind. Let's look back at verse 20, and then we're going to jump over to verse 13. But it says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. It's this, it's, it's, it's this Greek word that's like really deep in your gut. This, it's, it's the Greek word spalagma. It is what it sounds like, just spalagma. It just comes from deep down in the core of who you are. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Wow. The father never quit waiting for his son, watching for his son. And I don't think he just happened to step out on the porch the day the kid came over the hillside. I think every day he had his binoculars out. Day after day after day, he was watching the horizon, saying, could this be the day? Will this be the day he comes back? He was understanding. The father knew his son would eventually end up back home. But if you look back at verse 13, it says this, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Guess what? This son had no plan of ever coming back. He was gone. He gathered up all his possessions, and his attitude was probably, I'm never coming back. You'll never see my face again. But the father says, this is my own flesh and blood. This is my boy. I'll never quit waiting on him. And the story tells us that while he was still a, a long way off, the father ran to him. Now, grown men did not run in this day, right? They had these really long, depending on their status, they had these really long robes, and they would have to hike up their robes and expose their legs, which was shameful and embarrassing in that day, right? In fact, if you think about it today, you don't really see grown men running that much uh, now. If you see a grown man running through the mall, he's probably either two things have happened. He's committed a crime. Or a crime is being committed against him, right? Other than that, he's walking. He's taking his time, right? Uh, but this father hikes up his robes, doesn't care how embarrassed it makes him feel or look. He doesn't care about the shame. He doesn't care what it looks like because there's an emotion that's greater than the embarrassment, that's greater than any ridicule that could come upon him. And that is love for his kid. And he takes off running in the direction of his son. Now, here's the question. How would he know if he wasn't there waiting? with his eyes concentrated on the horizon. Listen, God understands everything about you. He waits for you to learn your lessons. He's patient and he's kind and he's long-suffering. And, and even when you didn't learn your lesson the first time or the 5,000th and first time, he's watching the road for you to come home. God's watching every decision, every mistake, every sin you commit, everything that you think you have hidden uh, everything that you've swept under the rug, he's watching. But listen, but God understands more than we think he does. And people tend to think that God is just this sort of mad, angry scorekeeper in the sky. That he's just keeping a tab and keeping all the record of our wrongs. And, and when, he, when we reach a certain point of badness, he's going to throw down that lightning bolt from heaven and, and smite us. We think God's going to get angry with us and maybe punish us in some way, kill our dog, make our car break down, make an engine blow up. We constantly feel this sense of, of guilt and, and shame. And it's why some of, us, some of us, it's why we can't pray. It's why we can't read the word. We, we don't realize that God understands us. 
My boy Joseph is getting big. He's growing up, he, and he's, he's emotional. He's six going on 12, right? He's got all this testosterone, like, fired up, and, and he doesn't know what to do with it sometimes. And he's got to, sometimes he's got to pout and stomp around and go outside and duct tape a cat to a tree. I mean, he's got, he's got all these uh, emotions he's trying to deal with. And, and when, he, when he has a meltdown sometimes, I don't always discipline. I just, sometimes I just hold his hand and I say, tell me how you feel, buddy. And my son Im- immediately turns more gentle. When a dad understands his son, it, it, it immediately changes things. It de- deflates that balloon of rage. And, and I know we're, listen, here's what I know. I know that we are all stocked full of emotions right now. And sometimes they feel like they're boiling over and, and we've got fears and we've got doubts and we've got questions. But we need to know that we have a God who understands. In Psalm 103, it says this, The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's actually slow to anger, abounding in love. And he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, So far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father, listen, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. And he remembers that we are dust. He understands. He understands. God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He remembers how he made you. He loves you. He knows when you're angry. He knows when you're afraid. He knows when you want to quit. He knows everything about us, and he loves us anyway. He's understanding. Here's the third thought. Our God is merciful. He takes you as you are. I don't know about you, but I'm very thankful for that. You know, God doesn't expect you to clean yourself up before you come to him. I say this all the time, but, you know, we don't change to get God to love us. He loves us so that we can change. There's a big difference there. See, look at the latter half of of verse 20. It says, he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. I, I wonder what that son thought when he saw that cloud of dust coming down the road toward him, right? Not getting, uh, you know, a belt ready uh, for the spanking, but with tears running down his cheeks, a smile across his face. Uh, coming in for a kiss, like, get in here. Come in here close for the real thing. I missed you. Let me ask you a question. I wonder, is that how you see God? Is that how you see God? See, this son has been in a foreign country with, with Gentiles, which means he's unclean, right? He's washed, he's wasted his inheritance on prostitute, probably smells like a, a, a brothel. Uh, he, he's... Really, he's hired himself. He's done the. He's, he's got so low. He did the most embarrassing thing a Jew could do. He hired himself out to another man, and the only job that guy could give him was feeding pigs, which was a filthy, uh, unclean, imaginable. Uh, it was the most unimaginable thing a Jew could do. But he was so broken, he's so hungry that he's feeding them, and then he climbs over the fence. He lowers himself into the filth, and he, and he where the swine feasted, and he saw the the cob of a carob tree which was like a cheap meal, less costly than grain. And he des- the Bible says he desires to eat it. He is so empty. He is so alone. The Father will let you leave. But will also let you get as low as you can possibly get. And the quicker you wind up at the bottom of the barrel, the quicker you come to your senses. See, God actually wants you to get to the end of yourself. And the son finally went, hey, what, what in the Sam Hill am I doing here? My father takes better care of me than this. I'm going home. And we know that the father takes him as he is. He wraps his arms around him. He kisses him with the smell of pigs and prostitutes all over him. Listen, you don't have to clean yourself up to come to the father. And just like the old traditional hymn, it says, just as I am. Without one plea, that thy blood was shed for me, that thou biddest me come, O Lamb of God, I come 
I come. So if there's something that you can't seem to forgive yourself for, come to the Father. Bring it to God. He will forgive you. He will restore you. If you find yourself addicted to drugs, addicted to pornography, say, Lord, I'm sorry, I can't do this alone. I need you. And he'll run to meet you. See, we can't relate to that because we, we aren't unconditional in our love. And, and in the culture that the son would have actually, as he came back, he would have actually needed a restitution plan. That's why he's sitting in that pig, pigsty with his pin out trying to come up with a speech about how he's going to earn his way back. Father, make me like one of your hired men. I'll be like a servant. I'll learn a skill. I'll earn a wage. I will pay you back. And I love it that when he gets to start giving the speech to his dad, his dad just totally ignores the speech. He's like, get back in here. Come on, you're a son. You always have been. You always will be. And 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, you know what you got to do? If you find yourself in the middle of a pig sty, you just got to get up and go home. Just pick up yourself and go home. I love what Winston Churchill said, and it, and it turned into a country song some years back, but he said, if you find yourself going through hell, just keep on going. And I would add to that, keep on going until you get home and stay home. Stop taking up residence in the filth of your sin. God's wise, God's understanding, God's merciful. And here's the fourth thing, God is extravagant. He's an extravagant gift giver. He gives his best every single time. And we know, we know this because when the son comes home, the father gives extravagant gifts to the son. In fact, in verse 22, it says, the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and let's celebrate. In other words, God likes to party. And you know what makes God want to party? When his kids come home. He says, put the robe on the boy. The robe represents the distinction of family. The father is saying, you're still my son. You never cease to be my boy. And he says, put a ring on his finger. It was symbolic of authority. Only masters and landowners and rulers wore this jewelry. Put sandals on his feet. Slaves always went barefoot. Children of the, of the father got to wear sandals. And, and he, ca he came in probably more than likely threadbare and gaunt. Probably hocked his shoes for an experience with a hooker in another country. But the father says, put the shoes on his feet. That won't do for my son. He can't be going around barefoot. Get this boy a, a brand new pair of Yeezys. We're going to take care of this kid. And he says, kill the fattened calf. Middle Eastern people at that time, you got to know they almost never had meat. It was a delicacy. And if you did, it was a parte, all right? It wasn't a private party. You invited the whole town. You invited the whole village. The most expensive thing that you could do was kill the fattened calf. The whole village would have been there. Most families would never do this. It was so expensive. And they, they celebrated. And they did it right. Because God is extravagant. Look at 1 John uh, 3, verse 1. It's really the gospel in a nutshell. It says, see what great love, who? The Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Listen, you are not alone in this time. You are not an orphan in this season. You're a child of the Most High God. You're a child of the Father. And he says, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that they did not know him. When you come to know the love of a father, you can come to trust the love of a father, even in the scariest of times, even in the hardest of moments. I want you to think about your life, everything that you have right now. Everything that you own or relationship that you're a part of, was it not a gift from God? The very air in your lungs, the ability for your lungs to function, it's all a gift from God. How do we say no to a dad like this? How do we say no to a God like this? Finally, God is, you need to know that God is relentless. He pursues each of his children. It's relentless. See, God doesn't give up. God doesn't take a nap. He doesn't hit snooze on the alarm clock. He just keeps pursuing. This is a story uh, that's about more than a father running uh, to the younger son, but it's actually a father who went out and pleaded with his older son, who, who really represents the, the religious establishment of the day. It's the person who, who says, you know, I, I, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm good enough on my own. I'm good. I got this. See, the older brother just lost it. 
and went off on his father. How could you spend your wealth this way? How could you spend our wealth this way? I, I've obeyed you. I, I should have some say in this. And this was actually a deliberate insult to the father. His son's not attending the biggest feast the father had ever thrown. And he actually makes him come out to him and insults him by not calling him father. He just says, look, you. And what does the father do in return? He responds with a very tender word. He says, my son, translated my child, I still want you in the feast. You know what? Every other father would have disowned you already for what you've just done. But I want you to be with me. In verse 28, it says, The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Don't, please don't ever become this guy. If you and I, listen, if we can't rejoice when a prodigal comes home, then maybe we're a prodigal too. When, when you can't rejoice in seeing God restore lost and broken people, then can I just tell you something? You don't know the Father. Don't, and listen, let me just say this. Don't let anger and bitterness keep you from going home. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't let your own self-sufficiency keep you from home either. See, the story ends with one of the boys outside of the house, and it wasn't the younger son, it was the older son. Yet the father went out and he pleaded with him. The father pursued both boys. He's like a hound on a blood trail. He is not quitting. He's relentless. And speaking of relentless, the one telling the story is relentless. Jesus telling a, a, a compelling story to a bunch of lost people, religious and unreligious. So just quit running. Stay home. Don't wait until you're in a pit with the pigs in another country. Just stop and give up and say, Lord, I want to come home now. I want to come home now. Because the Father's watching. I told this story before, but uh, when I was in, I remember when I was in high school, I played basketball, and um, uh, I was, I rode the bench. I'll just tell you that. Do we have any other bench warmers in, the, in your, in, you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Um, didn't get to play a whole lot. And uh, I remember even at times, it would be the last two minutes of the game, we'd be losing by 20 points, and my coach would, would put me in, right? Here's the great part. Our, our news, our local news channel always showed up during the last two minutes of the game, and they got footage from the last two minutes of the game. So it was always me running up and down the court. So when my grandma watched the news, she thought I was like a star player. She was like, Lanny, you're always playing. I'm like, yeah, Nanny, that's, got it. That's exactly how that went down. But I remember one game, we're losing by 25 points, and and literally, I've got a bunch of friends from the football team in the stands, and they start chanting, we want Landon, we want Landon. They just felt so sorry for me. They were like starting this campaign to get me playing time, right? So my coach looks down, he's like, you want to go in? I'm like, yeah, sure. So I go in the game, crowd erupts. Everyone's going nuts. It's like, Rudy, Rudy, right? And I get in there, and uh, at, towards the end of the game, this guy is coming down the lane with a ball, and he jumps up to dunk the ball. And I'm thinking, oh, no. I ain't going up there. That's way too high. But a guy from my team jumps up in the air to meet him to block the shot. And when he sees the guy blocking the shot, he brings the ball down really low, just scoop it under, right in front of my face. And I volleyball spiked that ball. <laughs> spiked it out of bounds. Crowd goes nuts. But you know what I remember about that day? I remember one voice. I remember my dad up at the top of the bleachers going, way to go, Lando! Right? And, and in, in, a, in hundreds of voices, I heard one voice. It was the voice of my father. And can I tell you something? Your father knows your name. And he's calling out to you. And he celebrates when you come home. See, my dad didn't want to miss his one opportunity to get to cheer for me all season, and he took it. And there's a father who's saying, I just, I'm, ready to, to, I'm ready to have a party when you come home and when you stay home. He knows where you've been. And he's calling you and he's saying, I love you and I'm waiting on you. Come home so we can celebrate. And when you get there, stay home forever. It's the safest place that you'll ever be. See, Jesus was really the older son that we always needed. Because when that older son went and pouted, when he could have went and brought his other brother home to his father, Jesus left heaven and came to earth and went to a cross and was stripped of every bit of royalty that he had. 
And on that cross, he cried out, by God, my God. It was the only time he didn't call God Father. And that's so that you and I could be. He went to the cross and paid a price for us so that you and I could be sons and daughters. So that we could be children of the Father. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that we have a God who loves and loves and loves and loves. And he'll never give up on us. I want to pray for you today. Father, I I love you so much. And God, I thank you for your word today. Thank you for this incredible story that reminds us of the the, the goodness and the the faithfulness of the God that we serve. And it's it's really a story that we we can all see ourselves in. And Lord, we all are in desperate need of the love of the Father today. And I thank you that that love can overcome anything that we're feeling, can overcome anything that we're going through, that it can withstand any hardship. And Lord, it is that love that gives us the hope of a future. And we trust you, Lord. We thank you so much for ministering to every person that's watching this. May they feel your presence right there where they're sitting. May they know without any doubt how much they are loved by God. Today, if you're here and maybe you've never really surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you've never really opened your heart and given your heart and your life to him and said, God, I I need you, I want to come home. Can I tell you something? He's right there waiting with open arms, ready to run to you. So if you're here today and today's the day where you want to say yes to the God who gave everything for you, who had his life ripped apart so that you could be part of a family, the family of God. I just want to pray for you. If you're here and you know that I'm talking to you and this is your day to go all in and say, God, I need you. I'm going to surrender my life to you. I want want you to pray for you. I want you to pray this prayer with me. In fact, I'm going to pray it and I'm going to give you time to respond and pray with me. All right, these aren't magical words that save you. Jesus saves you, but he hears the cry of your heart today. Would you pray this with me right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. I give you my life. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. God, thank you for saving me. Forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. Help me be your disciple. I want to follow you all the days of my life, in Jesus' name, amen. That's awesome. Praise God. I'm so proud of you if you're making that decision to follow Jesus. Let somebody know. Tell a friend. You can email us. You can click that button, I gave my life to Jesus. You can email us at safprayerrequest at gmail.com. We want to be able to celebrate with you. We want to throw a little bit of a party ourselves and just welcome you into the family of God. But thank you guys so much. Uh, for joining us today for Church at Home. We love you. God bless you. Crumble